But we begin tonight here. It is done. This weekend, after being confirmed by an historically narrow 50 to 48 in the United States Senate, Brett Kavanaugh was sworn in as the newest justice of the Supreme Court. He was sworn in immediately before anything else could happen. And then this evening, he got a formal installation ceremony at the White House with Donald Trump and a bunch of his conservative friends. It was 89 days from Kavanaugh's nomination to his confirmation on Saturday. 89 long, long days. But Brett Kavanaugh's nomination was not the longest nomination battle in recent history. If you set aside for a moment the Merrick Garland debacle, because, of course, his nomination was never actually taken up by the Senate, thanks to Mitch McConnell, then Kavanaugh clocks in as the second longest in the last 27 years. The longest is Clarence Thomas. And on an October night in 1991, after the Senate had debated all day long and narrowly confirmed him, Clarence Thomas, the newly confirmed Supreme Court justice, spoke, something he really doesn't do that much anymore. He emerged from his home in Alexandria, Virginia, and addressed the nation, accompanied by his wife, future Tea Party activist Virginia Thomas, and also by the nearly 90-year-old arch-segregationist senator, Strom Thurmond. My wife and I uh, came out to just say a few words. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm thankful, we're thankful, that the process is over, that it's finally come to a conclusion after three and a half months. But this is more time for healing, not a time for anger or for animus or animosity. Not a time for anger or for animus or animosity. We have to put these things behind us. And who can say exactly what effect Clarence Thomas's speech on his front lawn that night had, whether it helped at all to calm some of the turmoil around his nomination. But tonight at the White House, where Justice Kavanaugh was sworn in for a second time, the president did not seem to want to let the fight over his nomination end. Kavanaugh tried to reset himself as the impartial justice, unity and healing guy, despite his hyperpartisan, weepy fury during the confirmation battle. But the president apologized on behalf of the nation to Brett Kavanaugh and declared that he had been, quote, proven innocent, which, of course, isn't true. If one thing has become clear in the 48 hours since Brett Kavanaugh was confirmed by the Senate, it's that Republicans do not want this to be the end of it. They think the battle over Brett Kavanaugh was great for them, and they don't want anyone to forget about it anytime soon. The behavior of first uh, Democrats on the Senate Judiciary Committee and then the overreach of the uh, protesters at the Capitol have actually energized the Republican base. I want to thank the uh, other side for the tactics that have allowed us to kind of energize and get involved our own uh, voters. All I can say is that this is going to the streets at the ballot box. Uh, I'm going to I've never campaigned against a colleague in my life. That's about to change. But I think it really has energized conservatives across the state of Texas. Um, I, I think a lot of Texans, a lot of Americans watched what happened the last few weeks and, and were disgusted uh, by the behavior of Senate Democrats. I think the analysis that, that, that the Republican base uh, uh, is very much activated as a result of this. I think a lot of Democrats are going to vote Republican because I have many friends that are Democrats. The main base of the Democrats have shifted so far left that we'll end up being Venezuela. This country would end up being Venezuela. I think a lot of Democrats are going to be voting Republican on November 6th. Literally everyone in the GOP is reading from the same talking points right now. It's been impossible to turn on a TV in the last couple of days without hearing that the Kavanaugh nomination couldn't have gone better for the Republicans, that the Democrats and the woman mob have given Republican candidates a gift one month before the midterms. Is that actually true? Well, we'll find out one month from tomorrow. But here are a couple things to keep in mind. First of all, this particular Supreme Court nomination has left a lot of loose ends hanging. 
There are thousands, if not millions, of documents related to Brett Kavanaugh's time in the George W. Bush White House that the Senate and the public never got to see. More of those documents will be released, and even more will be foiled over time, and more evidence may emerge that Kavanaugh lied under oath about his activities during that time. We've also learned that Chief Justice John Roberts has received more than a dozen judicial misconduct complaints against Kavanaugh, passed along by a judge on the D.C. Court of Appeals, where Kavanaugh was a judge until this weekend. We don't know what, if anything, may become of those complaints now that Kavanaugh is the Chief Justice's colleague. And the New Yorker's Ronan Farrow, who broke the story of Kavanaugh accuser Deborah Ramirez, hinted this weekend that there might be more accusers yet to share their stories of sexual misconduct by Kavanaugh. We really do not have a roadmap for how to handle the, pros the prospect of a Supreme Court justice with so many outstanding complaints or potential complaints against him. How will such complaints be adjudicated if and when they come to light? So that's one thing to keep in mind as we go forward. We are in completely uncharted territory right now. The other thing to think about is this. It's not really clear that the Republicans have much data or historical precedent to back up their conviction that imposing Kavanaugh on an unwilling majority of Americans is going to give them a boost to victory next month. CNN is just out with this new poll tonight, taken Thursday through Sunday, so the final days of the fight over Kavanaugh's nomination and through his confirmation vote this weekend. The poll found that a majority of Americans are opposed to Kavanaugh's confirmation and that they opposed him by a 10-point margin just in the last few days. This poll, like other recent polls, did also find an increase in Republican enthusiasm for Kavanaugh. But it's worth remembering that increased Republican enthusiasm has not always been a silver bullet in the current climate. After Alabama Republican Senate nominee Roy Moore was accused of sexual misconduct in the middle of his Senate race, Polls show that Republicans stood by him as partisans rallied around a candidate they saw as under attack. But ultimately, that was not enough. The backlash to Roy Moore was so strong, Alabama elected its first Democratic senator in 25 years, who, incidentally, just cast a vote against Brett Kavanaugh. And in Indiana, where Senator Joe Donnelly is considered one of the Democrats' most endangered incumbents in a state that went for Trump by 19 points in 2016, recent Fox News polling found that Donnelly's vote against Kavanaugh would have a negligible impact on his chances. A third of voters in the poll said that it would make them more likely to vote for him. A third said less likely, and a third said it would make no difference. But the greatest cautionary tale for Republicans probably remains the fight over Clarence Thomas. That night in October 1991, the freshly confirmed Clarence Thomas told the nation it was time to put the fight behind them. But a year later, an unprecedented number of women were elected to Congress, many of them inspired to run for office by the shabby treatment of Anita Hill and the elevation of Thomas to the high court despite her allegations. And this year, of course, there are more women running for Congress than ever in American history. And a new Washington Post survey of 69 battleground districts in this year's midterms finds that Democrats have a narrow edge in the race to control the House, thanks to a nearly 20-point swing in those districts, from preferring Republican candidates to preferring Democrats. And joining me now is Scott Clement, polling director for The Washington Post, the pollster who conducted that survey. Mr. Clement, uh, really appreciate your time tonight. Certainly. Good to be here. So let's talk about, first of all, how you chose the districts uh, that wound up in this poll. Sure. So we started off with uh, the districts that the Cook Political Report writes as toss-up or leaning Republican or leaning Democrat at the beginning of the fall campaign, so in late August. And we also had some additional districts that Post Political staff identified as potentially competitive. And we drew a random sample of voters in those districts and ended up interviewing more than 2,600 likely voters. And so uh, according to uh, the write-up of your poll, of the 69 districts included in your survey, 63 are held by Republicans, just six are held by Democrats. Trump carried 48 of those districts. Hillary Clinton carried the other 21. Uh, likely voters are split in the Trump won districts, 48 for the Democrat, 47 for the Republican. Uh, and in the districts carried by Clinton, Democrats have a clear advantage, 53-43. Can you just quantify us how dramatic of a swing is that overall? Well, it's substantial. I mean, it shows that likely voters at this stage in the campaign are looking at the congressional uh, uh, candidates in a different way than they were two years ago. And, you know, a big factor in that is Trump's approval rating. 
Most of these are Republican-held districts, so Trump's approval rating is a few percentage points higher than it is nationwide, but it's still underwater. So you have a slight majority who disapprove of the president's job performance. And that means that it's going to be a struggle for some of these candidates to outrun that. We saw this with Barack Obama in 2014. Very few Senate candidates could get too far above uh, his job approval rating in the state, and that, that makes him a liability. And, and I'm looking just at the, you know, some of the states where these districts are located. It's states like Arizona. California, lots in California, Colorado, Florida. Um, is the challenge Republicans going to face that some of these are states like California where Republicans are already pretty endangered um, and states like Colorado that seem to be going more bluish purple than reddish purple? Is that a challenge or is it more the president's approval rating? Well, it's a little bit of, little bit of column A and a little bit of column B, particularly in the districts that Clinton won in 2016. Those are the districts where Republicans tend to be most endangered uh, because uh, th they were already places where there was a lot of split ticket voting, voters voting uh, for Hillary Clinton for president and then voting for the Republican candidate uh, for Congress. Uh, it's the larger chunk of those districts that Trump won where uh, handicappers like Cook Political Report think are competitive, uh, where the race is nearly even in our survey. And uh, that means that a number of those candidates are going to be endangered. And were you able to quantify sort of what was driving this shift toward the Democrats? Is it national politics or, or, or are these really uh, issues of things like health care? Because we knew those kinds of issues were important to voters before this Kavanaugh nomination. Well, voters said a lot of issues were really important to them. Health care ranked highly. Um, so did Supreme Court appointments. No surprise given the timing the, the poll was conducted. Uh, but when we asked people to choose between those issues and also the importance of President Trump, Trump stood out uh, as the single most important issue, uh, really issue or item or reason for uh, their congressional vote. And this was particularly true among Democrats. So 40 percent of Democrats and Democratic-leaning independent voters said that Trump was the single most important issue in their vote. That compares to uh, roughly 15 percent of Republicans who said the same. Interesting. So a check on the president being an important issue to these voters. Scott Clement, uh, Washington Post polling director. I always love talking polls. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Sure thing. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.